you're you go through something traumatic one day and the next day you are trying to stop the people involved that are causing these problems and the same people who were crying for your health the day before yeah. are now chastising you, right. crucifying you on the side of the yeah. street. And then the very next day we'll ask again for help. For your help, which we're going to do because that's our job. We're gonna answer that call but it's it's yeah. um, that's the part that sucks because you'll get that famous phrase you signed up for it or oh yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, that's your job. Yeah. How many of you guys signed up for believe like being a therapist though? I mean, oh. you know what I mean. I don't think anybody signs up. Here's the other, the other thing too. Like what I was saying just a second ago is is you know when we talk to these people, mental health is going nowhere. In fact, it's getting worse, right? Yeah. And we hear these stories from these people, like when you're sitting in front of a girl who's just been raped and she's open enough to tell you exactly what happened. Right, that that sticks to you, man. It sticks to you, and you carry it with you. And if you don't, then you shouldn't be in this profession. I've you've heard me say that a thousand times. If it, if it doesn't stick to you a little bit, and one, you shouldn't be in this profession because you're too callous. But um, you need to, again, those days are gone. We 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 listen to those stories, and then those stories aren't going anywhere. They're not, <laughs> but they and they stick to us, and they unfortunately spill over into our own personal lives and how we view stuff. And I think that's where, like what you said earlier about, you know, do this job, come in, do it the next day, and then still be the husband, be the spouse, still be, you know, be the father to the little father. Hardcore on one end, human on the other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And it, it's, a, it's a tough thing to switch on and off, and some people haven't learned that yet. Right. Um, and you, you, for your own safety, I mean, your own mental safety, you've got to be able to do that. Because yeah. I remember many times coming home from drill, yes. and I'd, I'd be talking, mm-hmm. and now ex-wife, but she's like, I'm not one of your soldiers, don't talk to me like that. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I was just talking. I didn't realize I was like barking orders or right. something. Yeah. And that's where, you know, you've got to learn that. And I think along with what we were talking about with the community just now is we don't, as a, as a whole, we don't understand that they've probably been through trauma as well, and they've not had any um, support or healthy way support. To go. Yes, right. yeah. so they they keep you know, especially in some of the inner cities, all they see is crime, death, you know, right. whatever, and they've got no outlet and they've got no professional help to help them deal with that. So what do they do? They lash out to at us, or they lash out to other people because they're going through trauma too. And I think we need to kind of realize and understand that and maybe somehow incorporate that into some training in the academy maybe. It's yeah. like, hey, you know, just because you're going to the same house for the fourth time, why are you going to that house for the fourth time? Right. Well, well, yeah. Why am I there? You know, what happened to, to allow that situation for me to keep going to that place? Or even part of, you know, it's, you know, I, I don't know if it's getting better now, but like, my FTOs, I had one, maybe two, who actually got us out the car and were walking the districts that we were assigned to. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Heading was big on that. And I mean, that's, we walked Fagin Street, we walked Door Street, we walked the villages. And um, that's when we, we worked the West Side, we worked the West Side. Like, we're on our feet in the West Side. They will, people come to us and tell us, all right, West Side's good. Y'all, y'all can go on now. You know, y'all, can, y'all can get off the West Side. You know, like, no, this is what we're gonna do because the people who actually actually live here, like, want the community to progress, are tired. You know, they're tired of having to deal with those things, those traumatic yeah. events, over and over and over and over again. Yeah. And um, <clears throat> or you have the people who don't even live there that come and commit acts of violence and then they leave. You know. And, yeah. They're, they've been allowed to do so until well, they, they know that Shoestring and the big white dude are and, you know, they're, they're walking around and it is. It's an awful thing. Hey, you know, I think it would help. Like when I first came out and went into FTO, one of my favorites was in the housing developments. So like I remember with Holloman and we went to, you know, Home, we went to the west side, we went to a couple other different houses, you know, and basically got out and just walked around and talked to people. Yes. And I, I've done 
extra jobs where I'm down in uh, Emma Wheeler. And same thing, you just get out and talk to people. Drive around, kids go up to you, talk to you, you know, and then there's a way to police and a way not to police. Yeah. So, you know, if they're sitting on the porch drinking a beer, like, hey man, put that in the solo cup. I'm good with you drinking a beer, you're an adult. Yeah. But no one else needs to see you drinking a beer. Just put it in the solo cup, we'll be good. Oh, okay, yeah, I, I, we'll do that. But instead of getting out and busting their chops, yeah. that they're drinking, it's just like, hey man, yeah. you know, hey, you know you're not supposed to be doing that on the porch. Hey, put it in a cup so no one can see what it is. Now we know one knows your business. And I think we, we have gotten away from some of that Mm -hmm. community aspect of just talking to people right and I know it's it's tough because the type of calls we're going to right but at the same time if you don't know the people in your neighborhood yeah. mm -hmm. then you're not really doing your job yeah. because mm -hmm. not everyone's bad in that neighborhood yeah. you're only going to know the terms so. you, you should, I, yeah. I think too uh, <clears throat> you're putting a title on it community policing yeah, up, I mean it you know it it, it, it creates a it creates a it creates a weird area that like you, you almost try to be too robotic by forcing it. When yeah. and when it was something that y'all were doing for years before we put a name on it, community policing, yeah. like why put a name on it? Just go out there and do what you signed up to do, yeah. and then serve your community. And you know, I mean, it's like you, I mean, you were my teammate in Adam North for for years, yeah. you know, and. We get it. We'd get out with kids all the yeah. time, all the time, and some of them were these kids that were committing these crimes. Yeah. You get yeah. out with them, you have great interactions, and then you hear another officer talk about them, and they're like, "Ah, that kid, man, that, that kid sucks," or whatever. And it's like, I don't know. I threw a football around with him the other yeah. day for like an hour and a half. Yeah. He was completely polite, didn't cuss nothing. Yeah. Um, I think it's you know, I think it, it it creates an awkward area where you are going to get pushback on people because they're like, you don't really care. You're you're only out here to do the community policing that you were told you had to do. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm hitting the nail on that one, but I, I, that's just how I feel. And it, I feel like, it, like it's it, not natural. It's it's powerful to me. Like what we, we did then, what we do now, it's powerful because the community doesn't see you just as a response unit at that time. Yeah. You're not responding to, oh, there's been somebody shot, or oh, there's a disorder, and then they did. They're not going in their district and then parking two districts away. You know, yeah. like it, they, this, this is our area, you know. Yeah. I feel like you need to take it. officers are not taking ownership of that district. Yeah. In, in, the, in the sense that this is my district. Like, when I came out, I bought a house in Brainerd. From that, I worked in the same area I lived in. So that was my community. So mm -hmm. my job was to make sure that my community was safe, not only for my family, but everybody else, because I live in the same community as <clears> you, <throat> you know. And I think that we have gotten away from that by moving officers around a lot. Yeah, and yeah. they don't get to know the district they're working in. They don't get to know the people in that district. So they can't really police right. in yeah. that district because they don't know the criminals and they don't know the good people. So they treat everybody the same. It makes your job easy. Having like, people in the community or even other officers come up to us like, hey, you know who's the shooter, right? And he's like, shot me. I'm like, yeah, but that's, I, I got to get out with him. Like, yeah. I got to. I'm just yeah. talking with him. He yeah. may tell me yeah. something. He may not. He may not. Yeah. But yeah. I, also, that person, no matter what, is still a person. Mm -hmm. It doesn't yeah. matter. And if, if, what's to say, yes, he committed acts of violence, you know, as a juvenile up until he was 18, 19 years old and nothing said nothing else. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of times I can name, obviously not going to, but we can name drunk people that we see every day in front of that store. Who, when they were juveniles, were chasing every day, guns, throwing dope, whatever, and shots fired, incidents, whatever, and they haven't touched a gun since, and they're not going to, and they come out and they'll, not just them, but their family members will say they respect you because of how you treat, address their, you know, and that creates that generational mm -hmm. kind of resurgence of, hey, the police aren't just out here responding, they're, they care. That yeah. They're investing their putting back into those people that they police. Yeah. Uh, and the kids see that. The kids come up and you know, and it's you know, you carry around your Santa Claus, you carry around a damn bag of toys. <laughs> Dude, I need to refresh my this past week yeah. and a half. My PO and I like we got in the wheel, M Wheeler a lot. We played horse with some, and then ride around on the other side. We were on Woodland View, then we went over to Jeffrey and got all the girls in the car and took some ecstasy and weed, and so went from playing horse with kids, giving out yeah. toys to kids, to 
well, you're parked out here with all this stuff in your car, you know, doing this stuff in this community with these kids hanging out. Mm-hmm. So she got to see that aspect of it. But yeah, that's yeah. That I mean, that's that's a caveat <laughs> to it. I mean, it's crazy how we can go from that happy moment to now we're. You know, okay, now, I'm working now. Yeah, now you're yeah. working and having to take someone's freedom away. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a game changer on our day for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it also lets the, not just the kids, but the adults out there who are, have, they have no problem with you interacting and, and playing with their kids and having fun. Yeah. They see you doing that and then they see you go right over here and maybe stop somebody that they know has been, you know, yeah. selling dope out there or been harassing somebody else to see you get out with them and yeah. they see that that police interaction which ends up good and maybe maybe they're happy about you doing that community but most of the parents out there are probably okay with it. That, that, that um back to what he was saying when you, some of that stuff sticks with you because it's like we'll get out with a kid he's doing good he's doing good always coming up to us speaking to us uh, <laughs> then he this instant he decides to do something on the other end of that spectrum, then you got to take them to jail, and you're like, man, I had so much great hopes for you. Like, why? And yeah. as a human, you know, you feel for that because you you look at the good in everybody. You don't want to look at everybody and be like, oh, he's a turd. You wanna you wanna have I don't want to say hope, but you you wanna see the good in everybody. Yeah. In some in some way. I don't always want to look at somebody and just automatically see evil. Mm-hmm. And it's crazy too, with as much as we've made years of experience here, it's like uh, you still expect, you still want to see that, that innocence, that, that good part, yeah. you know, of being out there and then even if it's not what's going to happen, you, know, you still want that. Yeah, of course. That's yeah. why we got into the job. You want to help people. Yeah. Doesn't mean I want to take them to jail. Right. But I want to help people in my community. Yeah. And I think if, if I went my whole shift and all I did was just help people, mm-hmm. like they've been in a wreck or whatever, and I'm, I'm helping them, right. and I didn't have to take one person to jail or write one ticket or, yeah. you know, that'd be a good day. Yeah. And that's what we really want. We want that. And I think that's what helped. That steer not steers us in the wrong direction, but I think that hurts us on the mental health side. Is that this is what we mm-hmm. want to believe? Mm-hmm. This is what we yeah. want to happen, and then all of a sudden we, we answer four shootings back to back. Yeah, and yeah. You see the other side of it, and now my days, you know, it, it went from up here yesterday down to here, and then trying to balance that is where we start losing that yeah. that humanity or that care for humanity because you know, it's going to happen every day to see yeah. what we do with but I think if we can get to that aspect of you know actually right. working in a, in a helping a community helping in, in an environment you know back in the day we used to do what's called um, well we did problem notification forms go through the neighborhood and, and see anything that was wrong lights out stop signs whatever and get those fixed Trash and trash in the neighborhoods, or you know, trash on the side of the road. We send those forms in, and three one one would come out and clean it up. Hmm. And then How's we also would do. Um, I've never done. I've that. never done that. Yeah, I, mean, that sounds, I don't think they have it anymore. Uh, Oasis. Can somebody just go by and check on it every now and then? Because yeah. we can't be down there every week. Yeah. We should do those. So you had, and we had a list of elderly people or shut ins or you know whatever, and you'd go by a couple a day and go check on them, make sure they're okay. You know, sit in and just chat, chat with them. And then, you know, that's another <clears throat> aspect of community policing yeah. is that you're just there to talk to them. Yeah. You, know, you knock on the door, you ask what's going on, how their day's going, do they need anything? You know, and they'll tell you, you know, everything's good, whatever. But especially the older people, they really enjoy that aspect of it because then, then people, other people in the community would see that you're just coming to visit. So I, we've gotten away from some of those things that we used to do when I was a younger officer that really helped in neighborhoods in, in the overall aspect. You see an abandoned house that was, you know, being used as a, a drug house or whatever. You call 311 or you call um, uh, Wiley, whatever yeah. whatever he does. Yeah. Um, codes enforcement. Codes, codes enforcement. enforcement. Yeah. And they come in and get a shut down. You know, and the rest of the community would not call it. We needed that. Thank you. Yeah.
So I think we're missing an aspect of that I think as we progress further into <laughs> yeah, well, that's police. I, I, you said that at the end there. So I think that, that there's some great that has happened from this police reform because I think most of what we're going to see from police reform, and I think most of what we're seeing in successful police reform has more to do with the things that we're internally looking at and going, like what you just said, I didn't even know that that existed. Mm -hmm. Why did that go away? What a perfect yeah. way to connect with the community and show them that you care, especially in the the, 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 the projects. Mm -hmm. I mean, no, ain't nobody going out there to make sure that those lights are still on. How many of those lights are out? Probably <laughs> most of them. You know what I'm saying? I tried to go back to get the one that they replaced, and the, just, they said there was no money. On the housing timesheets, they have slots on there for problem notifications. Yeah. But they've got, um, no one ever addressed those. Even whenever we got trained on, hey, here's how you do your time or whatever for housing, it's not, <laughs> no one ever talked to us about problem notifications. Yeah. But that bring it bringing that back when I when I what I was getting at is is to, that was something that went away for some reason right why did that go anywhere but on top of that now we have all this new stuff that we're learning oh this works too and we need to be better at this so I think blending some of the old with some of the new is what we're finding is actually I mean I, I as I grow I'm picking up some of the stuff more more of the people who've been here for a while and picking up some of the stuff that they used to do that seem to work you know what I mean the, the more respected officers like your, you know like yourself uh, or obtaining people like that um, and then just building it into new ways to to work that you know what I mean because mm -hmm. it doesn't have to have a label on it community placing I mean it, it's just a fancy way to say we're doing it but just police. it's just policing it's <laughs> literally just policing it just you know don't be lazy and sit in the corner I mean, if you could address some of those issues, like lights out over on the west side or whatever, mm -hmm. it's so dark, and yeah. it gives the criminals areas to hide. Yeah. I think the overall community would be, if we can fix the lights, we can fix the stop signs, we can do all this other stuff. It, it improves the community, it improves morale yeah. of the people that, that are living there, yeah. and especially if they see you just out talking and right. saying that you're doing this. And then, oh, that, so just that little aspect of putting lights and making sure the lights are working right. has really reduced the crime over there because now they don't have a place to hide. Yeah. So I think it, it, that would be an aspect of going back and maybe we can talk about reinstituting problem notifications or and we'd have to get public works on board as well and come out and you know, clean up big brush piles and trash on the side of the road. Yeah. So I think you'd find that, that like, the, the new, <laughs> some of the new police that are coming out People are like, you know, that man, this they're they're too huggy, they're too whatever. But they also find that they they're finding to me, it seems like some of the new officers are finding no value in actually being a police officer. Does that make sense? You know what I'm saying? Like maybe that is their value. Maybe for certain people that is their value to get out with the community and show that they're doing stuff and, and produce for the city. Um, in, a, in a positive note, you know, you know what I'm talking about. We've yeah. all seen those officers who they, they just never make, never make an arrest, never do a traffic stop, never do much of anything. Well, that's another positive thing that you can do. Traffic stops are important. DUIs are important. Getting guns and drugs off the street are important. But that's very important too. And I think that some of those people who don't like all that other stuff can do that in the community, and probably will do a lot because yeah. it's you know it. it it's easy. It is easy. It's an easy way to make a difference, and they're and they're going to be satisfied. Exactly. They 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 signed up to be a police officer to actually help people, and you know yep. keeping lights on in the park or, or making sure that the park is like hey this park's falling apart, like why do our kids not have anything to play on? You know what I'm saying? Like yes. people will feel rewarded in doing. I feel like that. sometimes we jokingly say, well, we need that type of officer too. But we really do. We need different we types of officers yeah. who have different uh, niches. Yeah, I guess you could say. And that's yeah. that's their thing, and they're passionate about it, and they do it, and good that because you, not everybody is going to want to do whatever the other officer wants to do yeah. as far as their their desire is a particular area to work. So having someone to do that means that that enables us to focus more on other aspects of the job. Yeah, we have to so, encourage that though. Right? Yeah, and sometimes we don't. Exactly. I don't and we that's definitely. what I'm saying is we yeah, look at it in a negative way. Oh, I guess we need somebody to do that. Yeah, you know, somebody needs to take the garbage out. Or they, or you get cast aside mm -hmm. as being, you know, man, you suck. Like you don't, you don't want to do any. This is part of your job. You're yeah. a sissy. Whatever, whatever it might there. be. I've said that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you Girl. know, I, I think it's incredibly important. 
I mean, because I'm sure that there's been something in your career that you've done where people are like, that's ridiculous, I'm not doing that, that's silly. Yeah. Or like you guys, um, you know, definitely with me. <laughs> you know, so, I, I see it every Friday. <laughs> do any of y'all get to go to community meetings? Or is that yes. just the sense of... Uh, yeah, we did until COVID. Yeah. Until COVID. Yeah, it's not been as heavy since COVID. I, think I found that was a, a good thing to go to, mm -hmm. especially because they could see that I worked that neighborhood mm -hmm. and in different groups, and then I would bring in, like, stats, like burglar stats or arrest stats or whatever, to go along if they had questions, then I could give them answers upon how many nine hours, what we're doing in this community, what we're doing here, what we're doing there. You know, this is what we're, we're planning on doing. Or so I think that would be good to get back so, to doing some of those. Ever since I moved to this side of the mountain, when I was in the valley pre-COVID and actually leading up to COVID, and I would go to the community meetings, when I started doing that, I've, I've only been to like five or six ever in the valley. But at, when I did that, I would not necessarily recognize everyone, on the, but they recognized me out and about somewhere, like usually a call at Walmart or call somewhere on one of the streets out there, and they, they would recognize me and either – mention something to me or, or just holler and check but yeah. your face is out there and people recognize you even more so in an area as condensed as where y'all work so I mean really uh, for as little time as you spend in the community meeting I think there's a much higher return however he uh, went to community meeting at the one on May Street and was like hey I want you to come oh, down yeah. I want you to come down to the next community meeting with me and I was like well, that's not my district but and he was like I don't care I want you to come with me it's like okay we went, and he's like, "Do you, you know?" He's like, "Let's. Uh, I need you to come down to four. I need you to fix this." Yeah. So okay. We came down there, and Simon and I ripped the mouth out of four. And we it was every day, and I had we had no idea because what the amount of truck traffic that was going on that these community members were having to deal with, because there wasn't an officer in the district that would. Go out and proactive. Go out and proactive. Yeah, like they would, like, be just mm -hmm. that officer that would take a call and leave. Which, you know, I feel mm -hmm. like that does exist, and I guess in a necessary sense sometimes. But it's a uh, when you have your community and you, there actually is an outcry for help. You know, that's and it has to be addressed. And that's what. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that I like the community meetings. I I feel like that's something that if you. Once, you, especially if you're a new officer, you get out into your district, find where that community center is. Go ahead and go the first couple of times. Figure out, or you go every time, but you need to figure out who who your people are and then yeah. find out what problems they're facing and then try and fix them. Um, and we we put I don't know twenty people, you know, in jail yeah. the first one in particular. The narcotics approached him and said we haven't been able to get him the entire time I've been on narcotics. 20 years. <laughs> you know what I mean? 15 years, I think, is how long he's been on. But. And we got him with a, a little logo on, 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 yeah. on, on the end of that. Yeah. Purple heroin on a traffic stop out of there. It was the first, uh, it was the first and largest amount of carfentanil that uh, Topping had seen. Hmm. Um, and he had it in his pocket. It yeah. About this yeah. much. And, and his pocket. I took it out. I was like, what is this? He's like, oh, it's just some <laughs> beans, cocaine, <laughs> cocaine beans or something. I was like, this is it's not. It's not I go to hand the side. We still don't really know what it is. Still, I got no hand. gloves on. I got no gloves on. <laughs> and I said, "Do you know what that is?" And he goes, "Yeah." He goes, "Yeah, yeah, man, just take it." And I'm like, "I, I don't really want to." <laughs> and he hands it to my hand. I'm like, uh, "No," <laughs> which I guess was payback. It's we let you know, oh, which I guess was payback uh, <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> We went to a, a, a just to kind of get, a, I guess, on topic, but off off track. Uh, we went to a house. It was an abandoned house that had wires fed into it. And what were we called out there? I don't remember. So it was a disorder, and the girl um, was saying she didn't want the people on her property anymore, but that she thinks they were cooking meth out of the trailer behind her house. Yeah, that's right. That's the right. Yeah, there's wires running in the house. The house is half burnt down, right? Yeah. And we go in probably. I don't know if we should have had enough necessarily if they, we were told they were cooking meth in there. But we went in, <laughs> and we get in there, and we're looking around. And mind you, the people that called it in, she owned the house. So we go in, and we're looking around, we're looking around, and I uh, didn't realize that there was a fan in the corner facing this way. 
And uh, I said, hey, man, I said, check this out. <laughs> All over. All he, over. Just, he just goes, I'm so sorry, man. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I can't say anything. It's funny, but not funny. <laughs> it's, one of those, it's one of those survivor moments where you're like, we survived. I mean. But they would sit. In, they would sit in the park, and they would uh, they would do their drugs. And we're talking about a park that where where kids actually play. Yep. You know what I mean? They would do, and and be a, they were drugs that required needles. <laughs> so, so Lord knows how many needles there are or were out on that playground. Mm-hmm. Um, she always walked around with a pharmacy. Every yeah, time. every time. She always had shrooms, had meth, had heroin, had. You know, one time she had a bunch of inbox thirties on her. Yeah. Um, just yeah. riding a bicycle. Yeah. Like just riding a bicycle right there at the corner of uh, Sawyer and uh, yeah. Spears. Spears. I remember. Uh, I don't know where you were. I don't know if you were gone or what. Uh, day off or something. But I got one of my classes. Spears at work and. I think Kathy, Kathy or Melvin had a war. I think Melvin had a war. And Melvin just starts dumping myth out of his pockets. He's just like, oh, yeah. no, I ain't got nothing. When he's back in the <laughs> dumping it down with nothing. And so I like run up, try to grab him. So I key up, then him, Stone, and I think, I think it was one of the females that worked down there. And they, uh, I have Melvin over the back of my trunk because he's still kicking. Kathy grabs a crown oil bag full of meth and chucks it in the next yard and Stone comes flying because I still had not answered my radio because I'm still tussling with Melvin. Stone <laughs> boom. Dude's a hazard into the park. Then Brian <laughs> came sliding. Yeah, I don't know where I was at that yeah. point. The, the Ford Fusion decorated like a uh, Mercedes. Oh yeah, we got a bunch of we got she's a bunch of math off of that one, a bunch. And yeah. she goes, <laughs> she's like, you can't search my purse. And she was the passenger, so he closes the purse back up, and we were already waiting for canines. And uh, they had just told me that the canines, they had just told us that the canines weren't coming, but we hadn't, I hadn't even had a chance to tell him. And uh, she goes, you guys can search the bag. And I'm like, okay, what's in it? You know, what's in it that you don't want us to know? And she's like, oh, man. And then he comes back. He's like, look, I don't even remember what you said. I think he said if it's if it's just a little bit of something, we don't care. And she goes, and she goes, it's meth. And I go, well, how much? And she goes, uh, she goes, it's a, it's a it's a lot. Well, how much is a lot? How much is yeah? What's a lot? And she goes. It's a lot. And he, he pulls out this mason jar, and he goes like this. He goes, he looks at me, he goes, and I just look at her, I go, you go ahead and turn around and put your hands behind your back. <laughs> and she, she knew, but. She had said that um, not, not all the money had been taken, there was still money. And then she, cause she was worried about whether or not the computer, the modem, it was, it was a tower. Yeah. It wasn't, mm-hmm. it was just a tower. And she was like, uh, was it was the computer still in the car? The tower. Yeah. It's still in the car. It's like yeah. Yeah. I was like damn it. We missed it. Yeah, we missed that. Yeah, hey. She's still in the car story. She she actually escaped, and then went on the run, and they had to find her again. Yeah. Um, she got. Uh, it's like twelve years. It was crazy. Is looking at her, you would not have thought that she would have had that much. Maybe now I don't know, but but looking at her, she she did not fit the visible profile. Of she was selling her for uh, for her dad. Yeah. She used. She would eat. Said she would eat the meth as a user, um, but that she sell sold it for her, for her father. And, uh, in a in a in a fusion with a Mercedes yes. emblem on it. And he, <laughs> he would continue to do things like that. He uh, redneck ended up 